I heard this morning uh, James Albo say that uh, we should start the decade of the mind. It's crucial, which bit I agree, because all the fundamentals are in place. And I beg to differ there, because unless you're really one of the most optimistic among us, one of the fundamentals is not in place. And I'm going to show it very easily by using this particular picture here to say what I might do to you in a few years from now, which is to substitute for you know, something that you have right now in your brain, a few other circuits appropriately modified, maybe inspired by the brain itself, and say that that thing is going to make sure that you behave and perform exactly the same way as before. You do all the things that you do, all the things that you know, full us of admiration for the mind, with one caveat, and the caveat is there is going to be no experience whatsoever associated with that. It's just going to be behavior. And we all know this is an old idea of philosophers. It's called the zombie experiment or something like that. We all know that if they gave us this option, at least I would never take the bargain. Even if this would may be mean immortality, if there is no experience associated with it, that is, if there is no consciousness, who cares? And this is why, of course, scientists have been worrying about the issue of how it is possible that any piece of machinery, including that one, included into the skull, can generate the spark of subjective experience, that is, the spark of consciousness. Without that spark, nothing would be worth it. Try to simulate it. We put together enormous assets in neuroscience and in modeling, but where the spark of experience might be remains totally mysterious. So let me talk about that, because this has been really my life's work, and ask, what can we say about consciousness? How does the brain generate it? Perhaps more importantly, what is consciousness? Because, as I will argue, without the theory of what consciousness is, we will never understand how the brain generates it. Let's consider dark for a second from the approach that we should do theoretically, which is that the photodiode now has a very small repertoire of possible states. We call them dark and light. They are just two states for the photodiode. It doesn't even know that they are not colors because it had no idea what colors are. It doesn't know it's not object, because it doesn't know what objects are. It doesn't know they are not shapes of any sort, faces of any sort, places of any sort. He doesn't even know they are not sounds, because how would he know that what he had before was visual? He doesn't know it's olfaction. How would he know it? He doesn't know it's not a thought or a feeling or anything of that sort. While we, the moment we see dark, it seems obvious to us. We're just seeing dark. But automatically, we know that it is not all the other things that we might possibly experience. And that is the most important thing of all. And it's most important thing of all because if you go back to the very basics of information theory, even prior to Shannon, what is information? It's the reduction of uncertainty among a number of alternatives. So this is the key property of consciousness. At least the first, consciousness is informative. There is a large repertoire of possible conscious states which means that whenever any conscious state occurs, including this one or pure darkness, it rules out tons of other states, and therefore it is highly informative. Now this, it will be hard to debate or argue against. In fact, the problem with this is, as I used to say, not even philosophers have paid attention to this fundamental fact. So basic it is, we take it for granted. But it might be trivial, one might argue, if you simply consider now an array of photodiodes, which really is what the array of some of our digital cameras are like. Let's say the one in our cellular phone with one megapixel sensors. Let's say that these megapixels are actually photodiodes and make them very simple, just black and white and just binary. Well, such a camera, as you know, can encode and store a huge amount of information, by which we mean that you can actually project tons of different scenes onto it, store them, and so the camera actually has a huge repertoire of states. So we might say, well, then it's completely ridiculous to say that having a large repertoire of states is crucial to consciousness. We don't think that the camera is particularly more conscious than the photodiode. You can see anything you can possibly see. And so, indeed, a camera with one million binary photodiodes, a pretty bad camera actually, has a repertoire of two to the one million possible states, which is huge immense, larger than the number of the stars in the universe. So what's the key difference? Well, the key difference, I think, is the second fundamental property of consciousness. And that is this. Yes, we consider the camera to be one entity, 
because we use it as such. But in reality, a camera is really a collection of photo diodes, each of them, let's say, with two available states. And there is no particular reason, except ourselves, to say that it is one entity with two to the one million possible states. It's actually one million entities, each of them with two states. And that is the proper way to look at a camera. Indeed, you can easily prove this, again, by a thought experiment. If you were to take the chip, the sensor chip on the camera, and cut it in half with a very, very thin knife, the function of the camera wouldn't change at all, as long as it doesn't collapse, of course. Because since there is no interaction among the various sensors, it's going to do its job just as well as before, which is to relay that information to some l further processing level, so to speak, especially to us in the end. But if you do this to a human, it's a very different story indeed, and we have known this for a long time, because if you do even the kindest cut of all, which is this longitudinal cat, other cats are much worse, and Morf Mishkin knows something about that. Well, if you do that cut, we know what happens to the work of Sperry and Gazzaniga and Bogan and many others then. You actually get one consciousness that sees the left half of the visual field and another consciousness that sees the right half of the visual field. Indeed, you have split consciousness in two. So these are the two fundamental properties of consciousness. There is a third one which I won't mention, which is time. Information, huge repertoire of possible states, and integration. These are states of the same entity. So, Based on this, you can formulate a first working hypothesis, which is this. That, well, if that's fundamental about consciousness, then if you want to build a conscious system, or you want to ask whether any system is conscious, well, that system should have a huge repertoire of possible states. So whenever any one of those states occurs, it rules out tons of other, and therefore is very informative. And number two, those states must be part of the repertoire of a single entity and not be decomposable into multiple entities, like multiple people. There is no such thing as the superordinate consciousness of this room. There is just each individual you, and that's all there is to it. A measure was developed, which ends up being represented by the symbol here, the Greek letter phi, to indicate information and integration, okay, something like that. There are other reasons why it's called phi, but nevertheless, that's a good reason enough. And phi is a measure of how large is the repertoire of states available to a single entity. And the single entity here is defined precisely, it's called a complex. It's something that indeed cannot be divided further. And that thing, once you identify through a very precise algorithm, will have a certain repertoire of states available to it that's measured by phi. And you can take any collection of entities in principle and measure how many states are available to it as a whole. It turns out that randomly connected networks have very low values of phi. That is, they usually split into independent complexes or largely independent complexes with low values of phi, maybe because they simply lack connections. Elements, if they have, in fact, connections together, they often share them. These connections are identical. Elements are not functionally specialized. Each element does essentially the same thing as everybody else. Usually, each element is connected to the rest of the network in a different way. So suddenly you have some kind of functional specificity. There is no outside world here for the moment. So the only way you can specialize is to have different relationship to the other members of the network. And third, despite this, the possibility is always preserved for any elements or sets of elements within this network to talk to other elements. So these are the key features in these simple networks that guarantee high values of phi. And the heart of the issue doesn't change. Lots of functionally specialized areas and within areas, lots of functionally specialized neurons which can talk to each other. A huge number of specialists who can talk to each other. That is what's characteristic of that part of the brain, the thalamocortical cortical system, where consciousness, at least full-fledged consciousness, seems to reside. So to conclude, Theory says that consciousness is the capacity for integrated information. It can be measured with the five value of a complex. You can go back to neuroscience and explain several fundamental paradoxes. And you have, have interesting prediction and implications. One crucial one will be for the future to see whether in the functioning human brain, when we are conscious, there is indeed such a complex of high phi. The theory says whenever we are conscious, there should be, there should be such a thing it would be interesting to know which areas are always involved. I will say one perhaps more illuminating thing about it to finish, which is this often comes up, either what's the use of it or why would it evolve, you know, 
because if people have the idea that consciousness is sort of an epiphenomenon that's on top of the working of the brain and the brain does all the behavior, why on the, you know, should it evolve at all? Why should it be there? This theory, again, gives a very clear answer to that question. The theory says, I haven't emphasized it, but consciousness is a fundamental property. It's like mass or chalk. 